you said you're a coffee lover. Hello, coach. How, how much coffee is too much coffee for a cyclist? I think like if you love coffee, like having around, let's say, 250 milligrams of caffeine. So maybe like two, three espresso is still fine. So um, as, as a coffee lover, this is tough. <laughs> Hello, this is Simon from Go Off, and for this episode, we have another Simon with us. Hmm. Hi, hi. I will introduce it like this, Slovenia. So <laughs> today we we have uh, with us Munchirski. Uh, I will yourself introduce uh, yourself, and we we keep on the coaching and training subject because it is the main topic for, for this season so welcome to the podcast <laughs> yeah yeah thank you for uh thank you for the invite uh i always always like doing uh doing this stuff because it's really nice to talk about training and everything related to training great so uh, as an introduction i've known you um since uh, i mean in slovenia you are probably one of the most admired and competent uh centers for sports um, and one of uh, the athletes that I follow uh, went testing with you with uh, some very nice uh, data that you collected from, from him. Uh, impressed by this and since there uh, the idea to, to discuss with you mainly on, on the differences between amateurs and pros and this kind of relationship. But first, I would like um, yourself to give uh, an introduction about who you are and uh, what you do. Feel free to go. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah my, my name is Simon. I usually always start with my introduction in terms of that. Um, firstly, I'm a coffee lover, so coffee, coffee addict, so uh, as a lot of cyclists are. And uh, yeah, I'm also a cycling coach. Um, I actually got into the cycling uh, when I was 13 years old. Um, I was playing a bit of volleyball uh, before that and I had a bit of knee injury. After that, a doctor said, okay, maybe you can try like cycling and you see if you can still have like problems. And yeah, like from the first day I sat on the bike and it's it stuck with me. So yeah, I've been cycling uh, since that. I started a bit of uh, racing when I was younger. And then after uh, a while and the crash I had, I decided to yeah, stop uh, racing. And um, yeah, I slowly went uh, into coaching, researching. I did a few courses so about uh, sports science at the University of Kent. And uh, yeah, with that, I started to like develop as a coach uh, with research. I started connecting with other coaches around the world training, testing, uh, and yeah, uh, this is where we are in 2020. We, uh, I and Tim Podlogar uh, started a company that we have uh, in which we are doing a lot of uh, physiological testing. We also do quite a lot of research in terms of like nutrition, training and stuff like that. We have some nice studies that we did on uh, carbohydrate intake. And yeah, now we are basically working with elite to, to recreational athletes, mostly in endurance sports, so cycling, some running. Um, we also have some nutritional support for um, other sports, but we are like mainly, mainly focused on endurance sport, so cycling. And yeah, my goal now or my main uh, field now is uh, coaching and uh, laboratory testing for uh, for athletes you said you're a coffee lover and a coach how, how much coffee is too much coffee for a cyclist how much coffee is too much coffee well you can in you could debate about that like it could be like three cups i think like if you love coffee like having around let's say 250 milligrams of caffeine so maybe like two three espresso is still fine so um, as, as a coffee lover, this is tough. Yeah. <laughs> you, have, you have to limit yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> also, you said you, you work with, with Tim Podloga, who is known to be one of the, let's say, hardest 
coaches when, when, when testing. Did, did, were you involved in, in the testing or you took other Guinea picks? <laughs> oh, yeah. With no, he, yeah, I did some testing myself. We did, we do a, we did a lot of like when we started the, the, the lab. When we did, uh, when we developed some testing protocols, uh, team is yeah really known for developing like really hard protocols, exactly. also for the research. Um, but yeah, he was like the main guinea pig for for that. Uh, and but yeah, the protocols, the last study that we did was quite hard. It was like three hours of like race simulation. And yeah, and then after that, we had some like performance tests after three hours, uh, you're basically empty and dead, and then you have to do like a time trial in the end. So that was hard. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. Good. Um, but you said um, that, I mean, you train um, all levels of state cycling people, so from, from amateurs to, to pros. What do you think is uh, the main differences, or do you see what do you see big differences in, for example, I don't know, physiological differences, or are there more availability differences, or are there like commitment and motivational differences? What What do you think about? This? Yeah, like yeah, there are definitely like differences between manager and pro pros. This is why we have uh, two categories. Um, I'm gonna say that they're like differences in basically all areas that you uh, that you um, said that there are so we have like differences on uh, physiological level so maximal aerobic capacity fractional utilization of vo2 is usually like higher in highly trained or little athletes there are like a lot of physiological differences but there are also psychological differences commitment differences i have like quite a lot of athletes in the lab where you have like they have like really high view to max or maybe like even some other parameters that are quite high that would make them elite athletes or at least like really good athletes if they really commit to the process and they don't mm -hmm. so yeah there is like a bunch of stuff that uh, it's it affects this is why just like uh, physiological side yeah it's important but it's not everything so because there is quite good data from um a world, one world team that i'm not going to mention because uh, i don't have to be like too much specific uh said too much specific stuff about uh, the data but so we have a world tour uh, team that had training camp last year in mallorca on, in march and they did the, the testing and like the average view to max for the whole team, if I like ask the guy would probably, he would probably say like 80 or 85, those are pros, but like the average for the whole team was like 71, the highest well, level. So yeah, well, yeah, high, but not like the highest. So there are That's definitely not some other parameters that they are like really high in yeah. that population so they can like su succeed in uh, in uh, in competition you you see that also in other sports though also in other endurance sports uh if i'm not mistaken like kipchoge's vo2 is not particularly high i mean being the fastest or one of the fastest men in in the world in running in the marathon if i'm not mistaken he has a vo2 of around 70. Yeah, I think it's something like that. I think the average for the two hours, you know, two hour attempt on the Vienna, I think that the, the whole group also had like an average of right, 69 or 70. But yeah, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Jovic had quite a good uh, running economy and really high fractional utilization of uh, VO2, so he could sustain really high VO2 for uh, quite some time. I think that with I like 30. Nine, 93% or 94% for basically two hours. Well, I would say something bold, that the VO2 is not the limiting factor for going pro. Uh, do you agree with that or no? Because what I think is, it, there are some other metrics that um, probably are more relevant, and more limiting than VO2 uh, 
in itself. Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree that uh, like the high view to Mac, so not as high view to Max, uh, could be enough to go into pros. I I would be like bold enough to say, yeah, if you want to win Tour de France, you have to have really high view to Max. Okay. But yeah. to go pro, and this is probably also why we are like forgetting quite a lot of times that when we are developing athletes, we want them we want them to go into pro sports. They don't have to be the best because there are only few today Podashars. There's only few Primoz Roglic because they have like really high numbers. But like to go pro, like we've seen numbers even in like 65 range and they're like good uh, domestics that they can do the work, they can ride. And uh, yeah, definitely. It's not just about VO2 Max. And then I think there is also another thing. Uh, in the past, the VO2 Max was considered like, I mean, this is your engine, this is your motor. You can tune it, but that is it. Uh, you can't alter it, you can do anything about it. Recently, I mean recently, in the last decade, even, even more maybe, uh, there are more and more exercises and protocols that aim at increasing your VO2 Max. So therefore, uh, what was once considered like, okay, you have 70, you have 75, okay, you have 50, 55, impossible for you to do anything. Maybe this is not the case anymore because you say, okay, you have 55, but you know, you've been on the couch for a lot in, in the last few years. And perhaps you can bring that 55 to 5 to 70 to something, to something that is, uh, on a high level and then becomes competitive. Uh, I had this discussion also with, with Frill um, and uh, it, I mean, it is known that the VO2 max with age progression decreases. So there is a um, certain measure that decreases. Decreases if, in my opinion, all the time it is pushed to the maximum. Uh, you have, you are reaching the highest point of your potential. If you're not reaching the highest point of your potential, I wouldn't say that the, per the same person at 30 cannot have um, a VO2 max that is higher than uh, this person had when they were 20. Or, or same, put it at 30 and 50, whatever. You, you agree with that? Or, well, yeah, it or depends, you don't like yeah, it? How how far you push it uh, push it when you're younger we definitely know yeah there is a decline after let's say like 35 years of age and like even for those who train on the highest level we know that like that decline might be around like 0 0.5 percent uh, a year so we would probably say like five percent every 10 years but um it doesn't even matter because yeah we have seen in the past that the older athletes were still competitive because probably their efficiency economy and stuff like that improved over time over like 10 tens and tens of years of training that they did and they compensated for the a bit lower uh maximal value of u2 they increased sub maximal parameters and this is why it's very important to yeah measure maximal parameters and also sub maximal parameters and yeah this is exactly Firstly, why you have to measure both? Because when you're measuring, you actually don't know if you're reaching the max value. As you said, we can have a cyclist that starts with a view to max of 50 and probably like in five, 10 years, it could come up to like 70. I had this uh, this this case with athletes I worked for like six years. We started around 54 and now he is around like 69. So that's quite a big difference. And then we have athletes who they don't do anything, go on the bike and they're going to reach the values of 70, 75 and they're going to trade for years and it might not change a lot. It stays 75, just the, the sub-maximal parameters uh, change. And yeah, of course, like when you're doing like in, you're picking a team or whatever, you're going to take the guys with higher wheel to max because let's say it's probably a bit easier training wise to get them to the higher shape so the guys with lower view to max yeah they might do need to train a bit like more structured or whatever there might be a bit more work uh that's need needed to be done to get to that level but that's not that doesn't mean that it's impossible and we have seen like quite a big improvements in guys that started like in really low with some really low values if they are consistent determined but in the end we still have to like 
be honest and say that genetics do matter. Do matter. <laughs> so if someone is going to say, okay, it's just the yeah. training that is going to make you good, it's not. No, no, it's not. That, that's the truth, so, yeah. That's true. But uh, I feel a little bit better now because if the VO2 max is not a problem or cannot be a problem for professional athletes, even more in the amateur field where things are not pushed to the limit, uh, this, I think, comes out even bigger. And what we were saying that, I mean, if you have two athletes that are similar, I mean, it makes sense to pick the one with the higher view to max uh, for some reasons, you know? uh, especially if you need immediate results. Um, yeah, of course, like short term, that is the better choice. But like, I would start to think about like long term, if that is the, the case, mm -hmm. because we also like in okay. so, in some cases, especially the younger athletes, like what I do know this is, is the guys that like have like really high view to max and they like improve quite quickly. A lot of times they, let's say they don't have as good uh, work ethic as the guys that like maybe struggle a bit and they have to like put in real, a really good uh, amount of work to get there. And like over time, you want to have like a hardworking guy who knows what has to be done to 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 be among among the the fastest. So, do you do you think that uh, the characteristics like work ethic or let's say consistency in training is something that is on par with physiological? Um, I mean, prerequisites to become a very good athlete or even a professional, or do you think? What, what do you think is the most important, uh, let's say, aspect that brings your performance to the maximum? Is, is it physiological, so innate uh, values that you have and you gradually reach them? Or is it your commitment, your time availability, um, your your nutrition, your training, your amount of hours that you put in in high intensity? Yeah, this, yeah, this is... This is... This is a really, really good and tricky question because if I'm going to say, yeah, work ethics is really important, somebody is going to start saying, yeah, but the, the genetic potential is really important. Like both things are important. If it's like 40, 60, is it 50, 50, is it 70, 30? I don't know. But we know that if you have one and you have the other, at least like in, like in quality terms that you do the both, so you are, you have like a work ethic, you're consistent, uh, and you have solid genetic potential, you are probably going to reach really high, high levels. And this is what we see within the best amateur athletes we see, which are on really high level. We see a thresholds of like 5.5 watts per kilo, which is quite high. And those are like, at, like amateur training, maybe like 12, 15 hours and we know that pros are trained like even 20 25 in some like training blocks even 30 hours or more so yeah like commitment and commitment to training how how much work you put in is definitely a big factor mm -hmm. yeah I, I agree on this and and also um i think that there is a certain time period when things can uh, can improve uh, do you see uh, that, say, uh, an amateur has a limited time frame, or for various reasons, um, maybe because also of commitment, because then it changes interest into something else? Uh, so, do you think it has a time frame in which it can develop his performance to a limit, or do you think this can be done indefinitely through his life? Because what I think here is that. A person that starts cycling and cycles really committed usually mm, can last around 10 years of fully committing physically and mentally to the sport. After that, mm, I see that mm, the motivation changes, uh, other things come uh, in his mind. Sometimes he changes sports, sometimes he has you know, a son, sometimes he, he has an injury. So, so therefore, I see a time limit. Do you think there is or do you think there is not? Yeah, like, of, of course it is like sports is also not just like physically challenging and also mentally and for everything to, if you want to perform and like really develop everything must, must work. Like 
it has to be a good environment where you can like develop and improve and yeah once like one side starts to slacking so much motivation you start maybe skipping sessions um then like over time it's probably harder to improve and then you like come to the to, to the let's say the limit that you had at that time and uh yeah usually after that the performance starts to incline uh like Probably we all have some theoretical limits that we have. Uh, the more time you spend doing something, the better you will get. Uh, this is why it's probably good to start early doing sports. It doesn't have to be like doesn't have to but be like really specific. Yeah. You mean by annual volumes or in general weekly weekly volumes on how time how much time you spend on a bike i mean do you mean like 600 800 700 years uh, hours per per year or do you mean i mean every single week that i want to target 16 hours precisely during a season is this considered like over a, a span of various years or is it considered during a span of a single year or how much do i put in a yeah, no, you have schedule. to like in endurance, in endurance sport. You always have to look in in years. <laughs> we know how far, how long it takes to like uh, make all the peripheral adaptations to to happen, to make like structural changes to your heart muscles, to like um, improve your central system, so your heart, your lungs, um, and this is why like. I think that if you get an athlete and you start talking uh, with him about okay, how are we gonna like approach your training. I usually say, okay, we're looking for the next few years because a lot of athletes come to me and they say, okay, I want to be good at the race that is maybe like a few months ahead and I'm like, that's useless. Yeah, we can prepare also for that, but that's not our goal. We're going to make a plan for maybe an Olympic cycle, four years, because in the beginning you're like just getting to know the athletes uh, and uh, yeah, after the time you, once you get to know to him, know what like works for him, then you start to make real changes in uh, in performance, and this is probably why, like every always, when we talk about like developing the athletes, we have to have like a longer time frame uh, for him. So one year in endurance sports, if you're like maybe just starting or are more in the beginning, it's nothing. Like it's way too short to like. Well, the message here is and I don't know what. Message here is have patience and have trust yeah. in what do you do over a longer period because. You can probably pick the performance short term uh, in a suboptimal way, but that will not translate in. in yeah, we know what happens in, in a better cyclist. After. Yeah, we know what happens if you do like early specialization in uh, in in like every sport. You get like good quite quickly, and you might dominate in like juniors, and then when you go to the elite level, it just doesn't go any higher because like you were like really good and this we have quite a lot of studies uh good studies from this topic when you see like olympic uh, medalists winners uh, world champions though that are like usually the athletes that weren't the best in like junior categories they, they got there uh, uh a bit uh, a bit uh, later yeah we know we, we do see a trend of younger athletes dominating we know like even the story of the day Pogacar is like amazing as a young uh, young cyclist uh, who won the Tour de France. Uh, I think this there is definitely like um, the training, the nutrition that like changed over the last five, ten years. We know that we like on the highest level, the development process might be even a bit better than it used to uh, it used was. So it's not like a brute force anymore. It's like we have some scientific approaches which work. We have like experience from before, and this might help in like athletes become better a bit earlier, and then also like sustain over over a longer period of time. But yeah, in general, like the best athletes are not the ones that uh, are the best in juniors categories because a lot of time those athletes are like sick of their sport when they're like twenty. We see exactly. that a lot. This this is a problem probably also uh, with amateur cyclists uh, because what I see with, with the people I work with is that a person starts training with maximum enthusiasm. Um, so the availability and the enthusiasm for it is sky high. And probably as a coach, you could also give him, you know, 
from start, first year that he starts cycling 15, 20, 25 hours per week. Yeah. This ends in a disaster sometimes. So uh, I I usually tend to to limit the, the enthusiasm of these people by keeping them a little bit lower in the initial phase and then probably raise during the semesters or during the years, the amount of hours spent on the bike. Do you like this or do you, you say, yeah, of I mean, course. if you can like, do 20, you do 20. To, you need progression. If you want to like get somewhere, you need progression. If you don't progression, you're gonna, you're gonna like get to the stagnation level quite uh, quickly. And this is what we see quite often in amateur riders for like racing. Like the first year or two, they like improve very fast, usually because they start like doing hard trainings, doing a lot of volume, improve really fast, and then they uh, start getting like problems or injured or whatever. And then always come to us and they're like, okay, I'm doing like, I'm training even more and I don't improve. Mm -hmm. I'm training really hard, I don't improve. And I'm like, okay, let's take a step back first, recover, then let's go, let's do 10 hours a week. I had this like, she was like 18, 19 year old cyclist, amateur, he just started cycling. And he he was he was really talented. Like and we started with the ten hour I think it's ten hours per week, something like that. And for him ten hours per week was nothing. And I was like, no, but we have to keep that. We're gonna do ten hours like for half a year, then gonna slowly start increasing that. Uh because otherwise you will just like pick way too early, you're still young, let's go like step by step, uh so you don't lose your motivation, like have fun do other stuff also don't do just like, like yeah cycle but also have time for i don't know try and family friends whatever uh the whole process the environment has to be good and uh yeah i remember probably like after a year we were at like maybe 12 hours uh um a week and he was like yeah but that's like nothing i feel fine let's do more and he went to the uh like summer holidays during the the um yeah, during the summer went to the seaside and I was like, okay, now you have a week for yourself, go out and like ride 15, 17 hours if you like. But when you get back, you're gonna have like three or day, three or four days off the bike. And yeah, he was like, he did that. He was like really feeling well. And um, yeah, after he got back, he said, okay, yeah, now I'm a bit tired-ish. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna rest so we can then uh, go on. So yeah, definitely always progression find a goal where you want to be and like slowly increase uh, to that because i don't know who gave me this uh this um this saying like when you buy i don't know your first car like your father buys you your first car if he buys you a ferrari what's gonna be the next thing that you're gonna oh, buy yeah, for yeah. yourself yeah, I see. yeah you don't have anything to go the same is like with really good bikes junior athletes like 15 16 they have bikes that cost like 10 12 k's so like really top end bikes no they don't need that because then you go i, I i've seen that this this year uh, a guy had like really good bike is like 18 something like that and um he went uh, into one italian team that has quite a low budget and he had like really good bike and he had to like downgrade for the race Ooh. bike like really really like i'm gonna say from like 12k to like 3k bike and that's a big deal <laughs> that's a big difference yeah, yeah, yeah. uh so yeah always try to like find progression like positive progression so where you can like, you also motivate it yeah, yeah. See how things go yeah. but yeah this this thing i think um, also historically in the pro cycling it was like this you know the Yama, the, the, the junior categories had lower volumes, at least in Italy, and then they gradually increased uh, until they reached pro when the volumes almost doubled uh, on a weekly basis, on a yearly basis. Um, I think that this is changing a little bit uh, because some, some countries in particular, probably Norway, but uh, it is now extending also to, to some other countries, increased the levels at, uh, at, at young age uh in increase the volumes at young age by quite a bit um so this brings probably higher performance uh of of those countries in uh at, at younger age but then probably they are missing you know the potential to do another step once they they turn pro mm, so um, yeah like this is 
this is i'm not i'm i don't have like the data right now so i could like be really uh like tricked with the, the data or whatever but i do think that yeah we might be like switching to more higher volume even at lower ages so younger ages but we do have a bit more intensity control i know that used to it was just like okay we're gonna do like at the juniors like let's say 15 16 years this is like eight maybe 10 hours a week but that was all hard just going, yeah, going yeah, hard yeah. all the time this the we definitely a, a shift uh shift in like intensity control we so yeah even younger athletes do maybe a bit higher volume but it's a bit lower intensity they still have higher intensity training you know because also like the races are shorter and this is also partly why they do um higher intensity but uh yeah we've definitely maybe see like a small small change here that uh intensity because we know that intensity control is quite important also because we see a lot of young athletes who are like over trained or having even like health issues and with uh good intensity control we can uh prevent that which gives them like more time to develop because they're not burned out at the age of 17 or 18. Yes. Yeah, so, so overall, from another perspective, we're saying that at a younger age, now there is a better control of, of the cyclists on, on what they do, which can, which I mean, leads and can lead in a beneficial way to have bigger volumes. Because let's say, I will say something that uh, when you're, when you don't know nothing about cyclists, it's very intuitive. When you know a lot, it's questionable. And then you stay there with the question mark. If you train more, it's better for you. No, uh, I'm careful with this uh, because it says if you train more and better, no, uh, it makes a big difference. So it means probably it can imply training less at certain volumes, at certain sorry intensities. Uh, but controlling uh, what do you do in a in a better way can can lead to very big big differences. Yeah, I think it's, this it, is where, it, where we're going. It's somehow. quite important how, how we are phrasing things because we right. know that in general, higher vo volume of training can lead to better performance. That is like clear as day. But, but, but it's really but important conceptually, how it's done. It, conceptually, it, it is easier. You train less, you go slower. You train more, you go faster. You say, <laughs> yeah. No. But, yeah and, but there are points where you have to like start thinking about how you're training yeah, exactly. and there is a point where you have to start uh thinking about how how quality the training is because at some point it's not the biggest amount of training that you can do but the least amount of training that you need to adapt to and become mm -hmm. better and we mm -hmm. should train for adaptation we shouldn't train for hours or tss or whatever we should train to like produce adaptations so th this means that if higher hours uh, let's say make your adaptation slower uh, for some reason, which might be muscle damage or something. This can backfire you. you know? So uh, the the optimal spot of of hours also for for all levels is is not fixed. Uh, some person can have twenty five hours as optimal hours. Some let's say some professional, some other can have twenty twenty two, some other can have eighteen, some other one I don't know double can have thirty, whatever. Um, Instead, for a person that is an amateur, perhaps for someone who has external stressors like work, uh, kids, wife, a different hobby, beers, probably the optimal amount can be 10 hours. And if he tries to push that to 14 hours, his life collapses. Uh, having his life collapsing means that also the performance on the bike, for various reasons, is not going to increase. Yeah, like, but... I think that the optimal training volume for amateur riders is the training volume that can allow you to be consistent over a longer period of time. If that is 10 hours and you're not pushing to 12 because you're not sure and you have time to spend with your family or if you get sick, then stick to 10 hours. Do it for another year and you're going to see a change. So don't push it too much if you are like, if you know that something is going to go wrong if you push it a bit too hard. Yeah, I completely agree on this. And what, what do, you, do you see between the people that you train is the general time availability? 
So I will, I will make an introduction here. We are talking about athletes that are prepared enough uh, or, you know, they, they like cycling enough to go to a coach, which is, yeah. I would say, above the average cyclist already. So an above the average cyclist, what time availability do you see? Uh, let's say you see probably, I don't know, 30% of these people are between six and eight hours, and then 50% are between eight and 12 hours. And then there is I think 20% yeah. the remaining that is above 12 hours, more or less. How do you see that? Yeah, uh, I, I would say that like 50% of most like athletes that like come also to, to, to us and like start training are mostly somewhere between nine and 12 hours. This is like a switch. This is something that is doable for uh, like, like 50, if not even like a bit higher percentage. Um, I would say like 20% of athletes are the one that we like, or we like to call time crunched. So those are that we say like five, six, seven, maybe eight hours a week. This is also when we start to like shift to lower frequency training, maybe just like three to four sessions a week, depending on their time availability. And like the rest, let's say 20 to maybe 25% are the ones who are like more into like higher performance stuff or like really racing. This is usually like above 12 hours. So between like, let's say 12, and we even see to like 17, 18 hours a week in some amateurs, but like 12 to 15 hours would be like for a good uh, amateur uh, competitive rider. Uh, and most of these hours done on a bike, if not all Yeah, of it's most like, there is some exception in the winter, especially in our part, because we have like, quite harsh winter, we have snow, uh, low temperatures and oh, what what Topia is always at 20 degrees, you know, between 16 yeah. and 20. <laughs> yeah, uh, so yeah, like here's some athletes like to do a bit of cross training over the winter, so we have like um hiking, uh, cross country skiing, and stuff like that, which is which is all good, also from like mental part, so you're not like staying on the bike all year round. But like as the January come, if you like race in the uh, in the spring, like in January, basically all your training has to go on the bike. And um, but we have quite a like it's good that we have like smart trainers now because it's easier than like let's say 10, 15 years ago. Uh, now with like direct drives uh, trainers and stuff like that, it's easy to do two hours indoor and shoot it like four times a week and you do two hikes and you have already quite a solid volume. I think it is much easier to find the motivation now to go to make an indoor session than it was 15 years ago or yeah, even 10 years sure. ago. Yeah, I'll definitely say. But then it's like, I know athletes who did like 15 hours indoor like 10 years ago and they didn't have like smart, yeah, yeah. smart stuff. Yeah, yeah, and this probably. is, then this is the, the mental, the mental commi commitment. I like, even if you take like, for example, team, uh, team Podlogar, like 95 percent of his cycling is indoor he has like great performance outside for an uh, amateur so that like, critical power of 5.4 watts per kilo it's quite good so um but most of his rides are indoor and for him like it's not a problem he does it yeah. six seven hundred oh. hours in the indoor during the even during the summer like indoor it's fine for him I remember I, I had an episode with uh, with a girl that I coached. Uh, it was funny, you know, uh, between my, uh, the people I have. During the week, most of the people were in, in Watopia or on tax or somewhere. And I saw these this graphs going on the map around. And it was funny. Then I saw this training of three hours and a half. And the GPS graph was flat. I called her because it was, hey, you know, there's something not working on, on the GPS track and you can you fix it. No, no, it's working. But you did, you were not on Zwift. Oh, no, I didn't go on Zwift. I was, I was, I was a trainer and I was watching the wall. <laughs> what do you mean? I was watching the wall. Oh, yeah, I didn't like movies. I was just <laughs> staring forward. Yeah, said, like okay. some, some athletes okay. have, have the mental capacity to do that. Like for me, the winter is always like the hardest because I really hate the uh, trainer. I'm going to do like hour, hour and a half. Uh, I'm going to do maybe some treadmill running 
but uh, yeah, like every year, there is definitely a week or two of Canary Island, so we can go <laughs> out oh, on the sun street because uh, yeah, like that's... indoor all day round. So all winter, it's it's not for me. And do you think there is a level of hours weekly below which it is, let's say, useless to to follow uh, a structured training plan? A plan, sorry. Uh, yeah, if you talk like in about optimizing performance, definitely yes. Uh, like there are some cyclists who maybe have like three, four hours available for training, and we also do like a structure for them uh, because yeah, we, they can still improve, but like it's not just about performance. It's just about structuring their week mostly. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, like I would say that if you really like want to please get something out of it like the minimum would be if you're like starting at the starting point so not really trained like eight hours eight hours would be like a goal to like start with and yeah like once you get trained you know that if you're like quite well trained eight hours is gonna be probably be detraining for you then you have yeah. to up that uh, but yeah. yeah like if you're starting probably like Eight hours is something we can do quite a lot of uh, a lot of good stuff with. Yeah. I tend to agree. Um, I think that from my, from my perspective, if you are below six hours, you know you don't really need a coach. Uh, find um, probably you can find some some workouts. Uh, you, you you can find plenty, and probably the coach doesn't make a big difference because he has very narrow room to play with. And if your availability is twice a week plus a, a ride of two, three hours in the weekend, you know, there is a limited amount of things you can do, especially in the, if in those two, three hours you want to stay with friends. So yeah, at like that point... Course, yeah, at this volume you have to start thinking, is it about performance or like having fun on so. the bike? Do you go on the bike because you have fun? Yes, then try to keep keep that keep, up, like be keep active. Having, keep having yeah, fun. And, yeah, and that's going to be good. Like, you can still have a coach if you really want want it because he can still help you a bit in maybe, like, help you not overdo it if you have, like, a maybe really stressful lifestyle. Yeah, no, It no. can also help you, like, motivate you. Uh, but, yeah, like, it's not about, it's definitely not about optimizing performance itself. The performance is not the first goal. Uh, mm -hmm. But, yeah, if you have, like, not that much time available, try to have fun on the bike and not like overthink stuff. Yeah, agree, agree. Instead, on people that don't train, let's say structurally, uh, in a structured way or consistently, I generally found that uh, even if you look at Strava times of in, in general on, on a climb, that there is, I think, a, quite a big limit on the around 3.8 watts per kilo, 3.8, 4, 3.6, 4.1, something. Do you see this limit too, or do you think it just it is it comes from different reasons? Uh, I think that this is the limit that um, people have. That there is a limit. There is a limit that people rush into when they don't do uh, in a prolonged way, like a couple of years. Uh, a training plan that is structured and follow with some goals in mind. What do you think about this? Yeah, that's a good question. I would say that this problem, I do see, I do see like the range of like 3.5 to 4 watts per kilo that is like, we see a lot of cyclists here. It doesn't matter if they train like long, like for a long time or they maybe just started. But I think that this is partly because of statistic it's, itself. Like the majority, if we, do, if we look at the bell curve and you have like normal distribution, this is where you're gonna see uh, mm -hmm. you're gonna see most of the cyclists. And then when you go like deeper, you're gonna see why is that? Yeah, this is usually the time availability that they have. This is probably like in range of seven to 10 hours. And the volume, if it's such like really structured and you don't like follow a training plan, with that volume, this is probably the range that you would probably get if you have like, let's say, normal genetics that you are not like really the big, the big, uh, the big potential. Uh, and yeah, if you want to have like more, 
uh, then you would have to like probably have a more structured training. Nutrition comes in uh, into into play. I would say like once you're able to push four watts per kilo for like 25, 30 minutes, this is where nutrition starts to play a big role, uh, really big because being constantly under fueling um, is quite a big problem. We see all the time, yeah, like athletes are starting to get like higher intake on the bike, but that's not enough. Uh, mm-hmm. And the yeah, nutrition plays a big role. Um, commitment, time availability, I think those are like the three things that have the biggest effect here. And this that is the difference then between those who are like sticking around 3.5, 4-ish and those who go above that. Yeah, probably in the 3.5 area, you have the people that train quite a bit, but have limited potential. And you have the people that have a very high potential, but they are lazy. So more or less, yeah. they tend to to go in the middle of the bell curve and yeah. to, to go outside of it. Yeah, there must be, there must be, there is normally some other push that brings you out of there. Yeah, Can it be like I, have the, I have the statistics from all the tests that we did in our lab. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's probably like 300, 400 tests in the last two, three years. Um, the average power for, let's say, uh, second leg to threshold, or let's say critical power, whatever you took, is around 3.6, 3.7 watts per kilo for men. Mm-hmm. So it's, mm-hmm. it gives you like an idea what an average cyclist is capable. We have like those who are like an, really An good. average cyclist that goes into your lab. So I, yeah, I would say exactly. again, average above the average cyclists because yeah but like we something. have quite a good we have quite a good distribution we have quite okay. a lot of cyclists who uh basically are not training or just bought a bike and came to okay. the lab we have quite a nor quite a good distrib- normal dis- distribution so it gives us quite a nice representation of like let's say and when we say average cyclist we say someone okay. who like trains four to five times a week, maybe like hour and a half a day in the range of like seven to nine hours, maybe eight to 10 hours. This is something what I would say an average. But what it's interesting, like compared to like some sub maximal parameters, we see that their view to max, so average view to max for an average cyclist is quite high. And this give us, gives us quite a nice. Um, because it's Slovenia. Insight. Yeah, because it's Slovenia. <laughs> we don't have high view to max. No, but it gives us like quite good insight in um, in physio- physiology in terms of VO to max. We see like everybody who is uh, struggling a bit with performance does VO to max intervals, and like most of the time, VO to max is not a limiting factor. <laughs> so we have to change some other stuff, approach the training a bit differently. So yeah. And what do you see? I mean, you said you, you measure a lot of data and I mean, the, the population is quite nicely distributed. From from what we spoke also before, uh, fr- from what I see in Italy, probably the people that tend to go to coaches and do testing is a little bit more biased to, towards advanced cyclists. It might be a cultural difference between Slovenia yeah. and, and Italy. So I I think that that might be the cause. but. What do you think is, uh, let's say, the the most relevant metric that you want to see in in people and you want to track in people? Because now we have, let's say, a lot of metrics. We have metrics about whatever you want, if you if you really want uh, yeah. your core temperature. You know, yeah. uh, can be useful, can be questionable. You, yeah. So uh, if if you want to monitor regularly, what would be indispensable for you? So the easiest thing, well, the easiest thing, like one thing I would go was probably would probably be um, the parameters we get from lactate profile. So first lactate threshold, second lactate threshold, which give us, let's say, the basis for all the training that we do. And this is like individualized training zones. And then we can track over time how we uh, how we progress. This is like also the basis what we measure in lab or when we do the tests on uh, terrain. Then we have like other parameters that are like quite interesting for us that are uh, some are sub-maximal, some are maximal. So we have the efficiency, so how efficiently we are using um, 
energy so how uh, what percentage of used energy goes into power what goes into heat uh, then we have uh, economy we have view to max then we have like fractional utilization of view to so at what percentage of view to max first like the threshold occurs or what some would maybe call aerobic threshold i wouldn't call it that but let's say because it's maybe more easy it's easier to understand for some at what percentage of view to like second threshold occurs then we have uh substrate utilization so what are we burning as a fuel at different like intensity these are like some interesting data that can be used to track how someone is developing but like the basis would be first like the threshold second like the threshold for those who don't have the availability to like visit the lab to test that uh, uh critical power so let's say our threshold second threshold um is a nice functional test it has great validity it's really useful and can be used to like determine also the training zones uh can also be like really good uh, parameter to to have I agree on the lactate threshold, but under uh, a premise, how often do you do you test it? Because if you make, uh, let's say, uh, a lactate profile after a certain training block, you have to retest it. No. Uh, so how, how often do you test uh, to, to be able to use this metrics? I, I would say a little bit more um, to see the development of your threshold, uh, let's say critical power you are able probably to do it without a test. So uh, if you're going on a climb uh, regularly, you know that climb, you see your times that you are doing with the same, let's say, effort, you have a feeling of on how to um, also on yourself increase or decrease the critical power. On the lactate, probably it's very difficult to have this uh, sensibility, sensitivity, because people don't have familiarity with it. So. For you to be able to utilize the electrical information, which is very useful, how often do you require people to test it? Yeah, that depends on the level they're in. So like some beginners progress quite quickly and you can see like 20, 30, 40, even 50 watts difference in like 12 weeks. We've seen that. And then you have like someone who is on really high level and where like the difference between normal performance and peak performance is maybe 10 15 watts that would probably take like more time to test so like in some cases you would even like do a lactate profile in maybe eight weeks or two months because we've seen that she's progressing enormously like fast and uh, like in general like let's say on higher level amateur athletes that are racing, we usually do the first initial base like testing after the season when they start training again, they maybe have like four to six weeks of some normal easy training. Then we do the baseline test. It's usually like November, December, and then we might do the next test in uh, March, maybe start of April before they start some specific preparation because usually they tend to have their like peak goals into like june july something like that um in some elite uh, elite athletes we might do like the test in november and then maybe one usually before they start like racing season maybe or maybe even in february uh so i would say like three to four months would like be normal and for some we may be doing like the third test which is usually after the first peak we do a bit of recovery and then when we start preparing for a second peak some do it like more often as you said it's quite hard because the test maybe isn't as sensitive if you're on a higher level that you're gonna notice like five or ten watts difference and i would also like does it really matter if your first like the threshold is 330 watts or is it 340 watts it doesn't matter we know yeah. how much of error we get from power meter so it doesn't matter uh so yeah some do like really regular like the testing it's like questionable the use of that is like questionable um you should like you should know that test when you see that yeah maybe or i feel that something has changed especially like for amateurs so they are not like constantly going into the lab because it can also be like stressful like do the do the test at the start of the year 
uh, or when you start like start training and like maybe in a couple of months like two three four months you do the, the, the test again so we're saying here that also probably having a critical power underestimated or overestimated by 10 watts in the short term it doesn't change too much because the trainings that you do will probably stimulate the same systems anyway so if you'll be doing zone 2 you have a range of probably 50 60 watts if this range is plus minus 10 the system that you stimulate is similar if you if, if you do a very strong effort two three minutes plus or minus 10, uh, 10 watts can be the difference if you slept well or not uh, that night and there is a let's say measurement error and yeah. still if your threshold is 300 and you go 400 you stimulate strongly something that is very specific being it at 390 or 410 then i would say if you do it precisely at the value that you want good if you don't do it at a very precise value not optimal but still more than this yeah like always especially with power and also heart rate you know we have daily variability in uh, in in everything even in the measurement error um so if you set up for your like first like the threshold which would be like the upper part of low intensity training you have it at like 250 watts always have it 250 plus minus plus minus 10 watts so basically from 240 when you're feeling like shit to maybe 260 when you're feeling really good and also like always when you're training like training at 233 watts isn't matter than saying I'm all gonna I'm gonna write between 220 and 240. So, but like when you do uh, when you put a, let's say you put a threshold effort to a to an athlete that is high. I mean a, a good athlete that you train. Will you see that they respect this? Or you said do your effort at 320 and you see six sets of eight minutes at 320. This depends a bit on the athletes. Some are like really maybe strict on themselves and they try to like be perfectionist and we're going to say, okay, go around. I'm going to might say go around 350 watts and you're going to see six sets of 350 watts. Some going to be like, okay, he said around 350. Some might be like 340, 357, 360. Might like which, which one is more people. common? Which one is more common that you see? I, I see from my perspective. Out, I see outdoors, that. outdoors, outdoors. I'm gonna say that is a bit more variable. But now, when a lot of stuff is done indoor, we know that a lot of athletes use erg mode for intervals. You have like they set it for a specific like watt wattage, and they just do they just do that and don't change anything. But I would say probably outside it's tilted a bit, especially a bit among my athletes because I. For some, I am giving like the specific number, but they always know that they have like a range. It's never just one. And uh, they tend to like do it uh, a bit variable, but there are some who are like, oh shit, I missed that by one watt. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What? But that's I, I, see, I see also another thing that you said, okay, you, you said me that I, I have to do six times or four times, 10 minutes at 260. I was in trouble. I did the last two at 257. This is going disaster. But come on, it's the yeah, same thing. Yeah, so. that's, that's nothing. Your body doesn't like it, probably even the difference between uh, those like three watts. <laughs> pro probably even if it's, I would say, if it's a threshold, if your body is performing 10 watts, five to 10 watts lower, still the stimulus is is very consistent. And it's very strong. Well, oh, I think we, we, we covered a, a lot of interesting things. I would like to go on, on some tech now. Um, so in the various years, we had a lot of things that developed in, uh, in the bike industry, uh, a lot of new sensors. Some ones were game changing, uh, the power meter and the heart rate monitor. Some others, I think they are questionable at best, uh, so probably from the ones that I don't like, let's say the guidance sensor, uh, for various reasons, I think it is not the key data that you should look at your screen when you're doing a session. Debatable. Um, I would like to know your opinion about the continuous glucose monitor. So something that uh, 
came a couple of years ago and has been banned immediately by the UCI, immediately or after a very short time. What do you think of it? Well, <laughs> if UCI banned it, it must be bad. No, UCI bans everything they don't understand. So, um, interesting tech. So if you have diabetes, a great tool. If you don't have diabetes, it's probably useless. We know that even the sensors have, uh, I'm just like saying from what, what info I have from the people and researchers that use it and understand the technology, understand the measurement error and understand the, what the data actually means. And um, like, if you ask anyone who is relevant in this field, it's going to tell you it's useless. Yeah, we're going to have changes in the glucose level in your blood. That's normal. A bit higher at some part, a bit lower at some other part. That's fine. Yeah, but the, the question probably here is, would you change your training depending on your on the data that comes from the glucose monitor? I don't know how that would be. Alive. What what kind of correction would we do if I yeah if the, the the glucose concentration changes a bit? Some might say, okay, if you if it goes down, you have the fuel. If it goes down, you I don't know. Like, yeah, it's weird. Okay. But we know that, that when we are like racing, doing hard training, one of the like key problem is getting enough energy in. So you won't be like, oh, the glucose level went down a bit. I'm not gonna take 60 grams of carbs. Yeah. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna I, I take, take 45. Yeah. 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 Like what? that's that's crazy. So yeah, uh, this or is something the, that like, on the same really, perspective. I, I would not adapt, for example, my training, which is this time I have to do 20 minutes at 270 watts. I will not change it to 250 because my glucose on that moment, on that day is different from it yeah, was but like last week. We know week. that those sensors have really big measurement error. Mm -hmm. That is the first thing that is problematic. And the usefulness of the data, data is the second one because it's not like it, it it doesn't like give you any benefit in guiding the training or not training maybe but you made the nutrition but it doesn't so yeah that's something that's like pricey look sexy we know that like tech in sports especially cycling and even other sports um we tend to like use it when it's like sexy and it promises like really good results um and then something that we want to like have because it's something magical and uh, if you have like a good good marketing for uh, for this tech like super sapiens had we had this triathlete who had to have it just because their his sponsor was like you have oh, yeah. to use that he had it for like four weeks and just like it just it's it's there it's not useful and yeah after uh, like four weeks he even had to change it it's just like threw it away and it's like not using that because it's totally useless yeah. and yeah when you have like a big ma marketing uh campaign it's like easy to easy to sell uh to sell stuff to people who maybe don't fully understand how how everything works if it's relevant if it's not but i think that the research that, that it's out there and that uh it's quite clear quite clear now so not oh, really that. On another day, we, we touched the topic also of the muscle oxygen monitor, no? You said, I mean, I think it is, over a long term, it can be a useful data. Over the short uh, term, for, for, for the athlete, I mean here the, um, the MOXIE, just to understand each other, the MOXIE and, and the HUMON, or I think there is another one now coming that is popular. Um, this is some kind of data that is borderline useless, I would say. It is... It might be insightful for the coach to have it monitored and can understand some things if they do a certain type of analysis based on it. For the athlete doing his ride and his training, it is probably limited what he can get out of it. Yeah, like it's a tool and we it's have to understand how tools should be used. It's a tool, it's a, like even Moxie, we have also Moxie here that I use occasionally, but not for training. So Maxi for me, so uh, muscle oxygen monitor is diagnostic tool that we use in some cases when we see that some athletes might have some problem. We actually 
in one case we actually measured were able to actually found the vascular problem in uh, iliac artery of an athlete's mm -hmm. moxie sensor which is amazing so it's a tool it can be used nicely for a certain thing and that's it i don't think that you can like use moxie really well in terms of like having it in a training so you monitor some like training uh domain training intensity domains or whatever i think it can be a useful tool as diagnostic tool in some cases it has its own limitations we know that um so yeah every like sensor whatever you have is a tool and you have to know how to use it because you know you can have a hammer if you don't know what to do with a hammer you're going to say this is useful but hammer can be really great for hammering nails if you know what to do with it you can use it for that but like the the what you can do with like you cannot shovel with the or at least effectively cannot shovel with the, the hammer but yeah in some cases it can be useful you always have to know what uh the limitation of uh, sensors of the methodology is um but yeah we tend to overuse or at least some overuse stuff because they maybe have like um emotional attachment to like yeah. a sensor or whatever because they think this is like the next big thing it most it probably isn't so probably sometimes we don't even know how to fully utilize this, the the sensor the tech that we already have uh, i mean this in power meters um, if you use the cp model you have critical power and the anaerobic reserve uh anaerobic work capacity however you want to call it uh i've very rarely or almost never seen a person having this data on the garment so this is is something that on higher intensity or in, in how do you manage a race if the race has certain characteristics so very uh, it has some intervals that are probably between five and 15 minutes is where the the exercise above threshold comes into hand and have a logic especially if the person is not competing for the first five or ten spots those can probably handle his his pace based on this information or also during training uh, it's some piece of information that can be used to keep yourself in a state where the depletion of the uh, anaerobic reserve is controlled people have this information and I've never seen them fully use it to their full potential in an instrument that they think they know perfectly so the, the power meter. Yeah, um, I was power, power meter is just for watts and that's it. And yeah, as you said, like W prime and then dynamically working with W prime. So how much you're expanding it, how much it recovers uh, between some uh, uh, harder uh, bots. Um, it can be a good tool. There are definitely some limitation to using like dynamic uh, W prime because we know that uh, recovery or reconstitution rate of W prime is different between between athletes. But this is something you can like tweak a bit in the model so it's a bit better for you. But definitely like for harder session, it can be like really good tool to like help you pace some intervals and stuff like that. But yeah, I think that like if you go on Garmin Connect and you search the the field of i think that phil skiba has his own yeah, so w yeah. prime um and you use that you can like help you pace uh your harder training because we know those like less experienced athletes tend to like overdo at the beginning and they're a bit empty in the end and the power starts dropping so pacing has uh pacing can be important even in like the how quality the the, the training session was um, yeah, it can be effective if that if you did the, like the first session, so the first interval you did all out and uh, you were dead by the third one and you would have planned like maybe five or six. Also probably in, in crit racing or in major fundus, because if after 15 minutes you see that you have 5% of your anaerobics are available. Yeah, but that, that, that can be tricky. Like, let's say that, yeah, you are competing on the highest level. Mm, okay the race okay. The, the race yeah. starts and it goes really fast and you know if i want to be in top three i have to be with top three guys it doesn't matter I if i depleted so i had this case 
of an uh, it was uphill race here in Slovenia and uh, in the end uh, coach tell me yo you know he he over sprinted me in the end he just he was faster and I was like do you know what he was faster like why and I showed him a picture from the finish line he was looking his in his Garmin and I was like why are you looking at your bike computer oh, yeah. yeah I didn't want to go over 400 watts you were competing for the first place it doesn't matter you have to go all out you have to do that either you got it or you don't so yeah it doesn't matter at that point but yeah in some cases it's great for patients even in races yeah my idea here was i'll make you an example you know the probably the in italy there are races that are common that last about 90 minutes so the crits and usually a lot of stuff happens in the first half an hour so people tend to use their anaerobic reserve to the full. Uh, my idea here is, you know, that in the first 20, 30 minutes, there will be 10, 20 attacks. At a certain point, you can, if you are very strong, you can follow almost all of them and you have to follow the big ones that you think. If you're not very strong, you have to select what you do. Uh, I mean, you have to understand that you can probably follow three, four, five of those and above that, you, tr you can try to follow, but it won't matter because you're you're dead already. So this can probably help you to understand which ones you should say, okay, this one I don't follow. If it goes, it goes and the race is, is lost. This one is that I have, I want to follow and I can do it. So this was my, my idea of how to use this in, in the racing environment. Yeah, so like it can be a really good tool to use in racing training. But yeah, once again, you you have to know how to use it. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. So sometimes it's just better ignore everything that is on, on the Garmin because if oh, you're yeah. racing for, if you're racing for the, let's say third and fourth place with three people and you're there, all that matters is the person that comes. Yeah, like on. on the finish line, they're not going around and asking, how much was your sprint? Oh, it yeah. was 1200 watts. Okay, how much was yours? I had 1500 watts. Okay, you win because you had higher power. Yeah, exactly. Um, no. It doesn't go like that. No. Like he was the fastest, sorry. <laughs> one of the last questions. Uh, one thing that is developing as tech and um, I really like it. Uh, I would say I, I really like it and I want to see where this is going. So the continuous lactate monitor, your opinion? I don't actually have an opinion yet because I'm always like, at the new tech, I'm always passionate about it. It's like the quality of the data, and then it's the usefulness of the data. We know that like, okay, this is continuous, but know that we have like partially continuous measurement in terms of like mm -hmm. some spot lag that's checked during the, the, the training when we do like maybe steady state zone one, zone two, and we check la lactate in between, or maybe when we do an interval and we check lactate at, at, at the end. We have a lot of limitations there and then it comes the same we're gonna still have the same limitations we're just gonna measure it like constantly so yeah. i think that it might be good we're gonna see when the tech comes out how it works um the data might be interesting but right now uh it wouldn't be fair for me to have like a, a opinion rather than a bit of skepticism because i don't know how it's gonna play out uh like even like glu continuous glucose monitoring was like something that was like thought of it's going to be like really good useful thing and then over time we've seen that it's not really useful like that might be more useful but um yeah we'll see uh, because we know we have limitations with lactate so lactate it's lactate itself as a um, control of intensity has its limitations uh because we have quite a bit of uh, daily variability look even if you take absolute values we did this this uh, this study here in the lab and we were like looking at how uh maximal lactate steady state in terms of absolute lactate level changes uh, during the visits so uh, one day it's like 300 watts and 3.5 millimoles the next day or two days later is going to be 300 watts but it's going to be 5.2 millimoles and that's like something that you have to have in mind when you're like utilizing even the continuous uh, lactate monitor uh, but yeah it's gonna be interesting to see I'm not hard for me to say now uh, could be useful could be like just another gimmick <laughs> we'll see okay. yeah we'll see.
I'm very curious to see where this is going, and I think when it comes out, I'll, I'm already signed up for the beta. Yeah, like I, 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 I'm really interested in the data and like the the, the stuff that we test in the lab, from like metabolic card and everything else. We 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 are like a bit crazy about uh, the quality of the data, and I'm like I'm really into the tech that is coming out also for like tracking. HRV, like group or everything, stuff like that. I have everything, tested everything because I'm really interested in mm-hmm. that. But um, yeah, keep it simple. Test, keep it simple see. and uh, yeah, uh, first uh, test, first see how, how it works, if it is usable. And yeah, as we said yeah. before, sometimes it's some things are very nice to know, some things we yeah. can probably I know that's live, like, live without. That, that would be like, even for like that, you know, that like a few years back, there were some attempts of making an optical sensor for like determining lactate values uh, from like a uh, similar technology that it's, uh, the Moxie has, uh, but it didn't, uh, didn't pan out. So yeah, we'll see when the technology comes out, how, how that's going to work. And then we can decide, is it sensitive enough? Do we get a useful amount of data? Um, because yeah. some of these devices are very pricey and like but, having a really expensive device for the data that doesn't tell you actually anything, it's better not to have it. It doesn't give anything yet though, because if you go back 30 years, this was the same reasoning for the power meters. Yeah. Because we, we, we will see. Let's, let's, yeah, let's be exactly. positive we'll here. See. Yeah, I, I want. I want. I really want to leave the next big technological upgrade because in the past thirty years we didn't have. Let's say we didn't have any. I mean, the uh, biggest, the biggest, the thing that changed everything was the power meter, and we're still probably there with, with most of the thing we do at at amateur level. Probably yeah. at professional levels, the measurements that people take into consideration are still linked to the power meter mostly. So this signals how strong and how important this this piece of information is. Yeah, but is like for, from, also. I would say like all the new tech and the, the those breakthrough in like technology measurement techniques that are coming out, I would say that is really good, especially from like diagnostics point of view. <laughs> I mean, once we go to the training, we want to make training, even yeah, though it's well. a really complex thing, we want to make it as simple as, as it can be because shouldn't be too stressful for that. It's if he has like 60 numbers to look at during your training, oh, yeah. he's gonna lose his mind. And even like when you're planning the training, this is where we see like with maybe some new coaches, so it doesn't matter. Like some coaches make like really complex training, so it's like really hard oh, yeah. to follow it because it has like really it's like the really specific structures. Yeah, like we it's so complex. Twenty yeah. stages and each with time. With that complexity, you can quite quickly like lose the sight of what mm-hmm. the session actually, uh, what you wanted to, to achieve with that session. Uh, and uh, yeah, make it simple. Uh, use like use power or use yeah. RPE or use heart rate, and you can then make some correction after. So you see the what how that we did, and you say, okay, that was fine. Try to be a bit more, um, more. I don't know. Look at your power data a bit more and try to pace it a bit more evenly, and then mm-hmm. it's going to be. Good. And then you make those kind of errors, so you're not over flooding with like on the training with all the numbers and stuff because it, you're going to lose your mind. <laughs> I will give you the final question. So we talk about simplicity during trainings. What do you want to see on the Garmin? I will tell you mine. Second, so first, first you go with what do you as athlete want to see on the Garmin when you do an interval? Oh, okay. I go, I, I go first. Yeah, you go first. <laughs> okay. So like my Garmin screen, so first screen that I have is quite simple. I have the, the time and then you have, I have the speed, uh, I have the power, I have the heart rate. Um, and. What do I have? That's probably, maybe I have, not really sure. Maybe I have another field on the first screen. And th- that's it. That that puts me into the spot. Okay, you are running outside. Let's say that I say today is zone two. What you can focus, let's say 150 to 200 watts. This is what I want to see in terms of power. And that's it, nothing else. If I do intervals, I have like another screen that have maybe statistics for intervals. So average power for interval, 
um, maybe uh, average RAM, so how far, how fast are the slides, maybe some averages for that. But in general, my screen is quite like boring. <laughs> it doesn't have any charts or whatever, timing zones, blah, 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 uh, because yeah, it's the basic stuff. It's time, it's the intensity that you have, either it's heart rate or, or, um, or uh, power. And that's it. Yeah, you can have cadence, you can have that, but I, I like to keep it simple. Uh, I, I will tell you mine now. So I mainly have two screens. The first one is very similar to yours. It says watts at this moment. It says kilometers done, time spent. And one of the key metrics is what time of the day is it? Because if I have to be back for lunch, I have to be back for lunch. <laughs> so temperatures so if you see like 40 okay that's really hot maybe i should like start thinking when i'm gonna get the next water bottle then like in some cases they also might have like um kilo juice so work done or maybe in calories it doesn't matter so if you maybe set because some athletes like or even some coaches i've seen set the the uh so lower intensity training they said by the certain amount of work they want to achieve mm -hmm. uh i've seen that maybe more in triathlon um so they said like well, let's do today's easy ride but we want to do 4000 kilojoules of work go out and do that okay fine like you can calculate what that means you're usually riding around 200 watts that's easy that means like six mm -hmm. hours of, of riding and yeah it can be also useful so they yeah, always find for what you're like aiming for in training. And keep it simple. Great. Yeah. Simon, many, many thanks for for this. I mean, I think we covered really a lot of topics. Uh, we went quite in depth on, on some and we, we said what, what we like with what we don't like. And I think it was, it was overall very nice to, to see the, the things from, from your perspective, uh, from Slovenia perspective. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. more, more balance in the back or uh, <laughs> compared to Italy. Um, well, it's interesting. High, like I, I have, a, I have a few athletes. I have a few cyclists from Italy that are also racing there. Uh, but I mean, I said there like some similarity between like coaching philosophies. But there are like there are some also some some differences in uh, in coaching styles uh, there and maybe here. So always interesting to see. So again, thank, thanks a lot for this. And we'll see yeah, you thanks. probably, I will come to visit you probably sometime you know, around the area because I have some good friends around Bled, which is not very far oh, from where you are. <laughs> that's, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for invite. And yeah, definitely if you're like around, you can always, always visit when you will be interested in some data, you can always come from the test. And since I know you from Matteo, who is doing a test in the uh, before the season, um, definitely maybe start, if he's going to have time, maybe start thinking for another test. You can come, uh, we can do another test to see how because I've I've seen that he progressed quite nicely. So definitely we can visit so we can uh, compare how how he improved and uh, because the season is going to start quite soon. So uh, they oh, are at, we will see I think they, they are at they are on the training camp right now, right? Yeah, they're in Croatia somewhere. Yeah, that, that's going to be fun. So, like, yeah, if he has time in the second part of January, you're going to see how it fits his plan. I think that even when he first visited, I said that 
probably like the second part of Feb- January or first yeah. part of February if you can, uh, you can visit again. Many thanks again. Have a great yeah, day. Thanks for the invite and have a nice day. Bye bye. Bye.